Is that better? OK, there we go. So thank you all for joining. Um, this has actually uh, been a very interesting talk to think through and, and discuss. And the only talk I've ever given at a, an event where I've had press requests for interview to, to explain what I'm going to talk about beforehand, which is strange because I thought the title was fairly self-explanatory. But um, so my name is Mark Baker. I'm a product manager at uh, Canonical with a sales engineering and, and marketing kind of background. I've been to, I, I couldn't quite remember, seven summits, something like that, but many of them. Um, participant in the Win the Enterprise Working Group, uh, which is now just called the Enterprise Working Group as of yesterday, uh, and do various things, but mainly I'm a father now. So uh, irony, irony alert, and the gentleman here at the front who just asked this question was that um, I'm aware that having a talk selected that says the se selection process is broken has a certain sort of circular irony about it. Um, and uh, kind of disproves one of the major points I was trying to make when I submitted the talk. So, um, so I, I'm well aware of that. Now, irony alert number two is um, that after submitting the talk, I was then approached and requested or asked if I'd like to be a track chair, which answered a whole number of the questions that I was originally raising when I submitted um, this talk. So, but the good thing is it gave me a great insight into how the, how the process works um, and you know, what, what works and, and, and where the areas for improvement are. So the motivations for this talk were, um, you know, I work for a vendor. Who works for a vendor in here that's involved in the ecosystem? OK. And so I work for a vendor. And um, there is pressure on vendors that want to be uh, uh, participating in this ecosystem and be seen to be participating to try and get talks accepted, right? It's, um, it's part of how we represent ourselves to out to the OpenStack community as active participants is by standing up on a stage here and, and saying, this is what we're thinking, or here's what we're contributing, or these are the, the things that we want to do. Um, and so there's pressure. And that's not understanding how the system worked, and actually, truth be known, failing to get talks expected was one of the motivations for doing this, right? So um, point number three on there was, was just, when other people were getting talks accepted, there was sort of natural suspicions that, well, what were they doing, right? Were they giving the backhanders to people? Or, or were they gaming the selection system? Did they have special inside knowledge that we don't? Everyone's just shaking their heads, no backhanders. So, but there was, um, but there was definite, you know, how come they're getting it? Is they just writing better talks? Are they better presenters? You know, how's it working? And of course, we never want to think that, right, as when you're submitting a talk. My talk is going to be the best talk ever. Uh, and if somebody else's talk gets selected, um, clearly they have unfair advantage. So it was suspicions around that and failure to understand why some got selected. Um, but also to try and improve it, because um, uh, the way that, you know, having seen this over the, certainly the last three summits, um, it, you know, it fell the point that we need to try and improve things. We need to try and change things. And that was, you know, probably the biggest motivation for, for doing this talk so that we don't have to have the same discussion again next time. So the great news, um, this is kind of a luxury problem, right? And this is your slide, Find Ocean People. So thank you for sending me this graphic or giving me the access to it. But the luxury problem is, is that the, the, the summit has grown from you know, a mere 75 people, although the number of people I meet that say that they were at that first summit, <laughs> <laughs> you can add a zero onto that easily. Um, but but the, it's a luxury problem. So it's gone from 75 people all the way up to wherever we are today. It's like 7,000, something like that here today. Uh, last couple of days. So it's a big, big problem. Uh, it's, sorry, it's a big growth, huge growth over, over four years. And um, uh, that growth in the number of attendees means that vendors like us and community members that are all very excited about OpenStack want to participate, want to submit talks, want to be seen, want to be contributing. And so those numbers, um, and again, thanks to the people that provided this, if you look at the, the numbers of total sessions that there have been since uh, since it started, um, you know, it grew from San Diego with roughly a hundred to today in Vancouver. I, this is just somebody's already disputed these numbers, but so you can tell me if they're right or wrong. Four hundred. And is that for the summit, including design summit? OK. 
school for Frankfurt. Okay, good, 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 good. The, <laughs> all righty, thank you for that. So, um, but I think, I mean, the big jump there between Paris and Vancouver was we have an extra day, right? Which is point number one. Point number two is I think we just seem to have more rooms. I don't know if that's true or not. So there, there were more slots available. But the total number of sessions, you know, it's grown a big, big jump with Paris, Vancouver, but it hasn't grown at the same extent. If we go back the slide, you know, from Austin all the way up to, 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 to where we are today, right? So many more attendees, many more vendors participating, uh, and proportionally less slots available. If we map that against the number of submissions, well, we didn't get that data for uh, up until Paris, but um, uh, 1,100 uh, or so, and, and the same number again for Vancouver. So the talk selection process, you know, you're looking at sort of 10%, 20% of the talks being um, submitted are going to actually going to get selected. Right, 80% of the talks get thrown thrown away. And I've um, spoken to several people who uh, have said they don't bother submitting talks anymore because they don't. The chances of it being selected are so slim, and that's a sad state. I think. Right, we need to try and ensure that people have confidence that if they're contributing good content, that it, it stands a good chance of being selected. So the, the four steps for those, I know foundation people know this, but for those who don't, the, the way that this process um, currently works is that it's a four-step process, right? There's a, a call for papers um, that goes out. Uh, I believe the call for papers for Tokyo is going to go out pretty soon, right? June? OK, so not very far away. We're only just recovering from the one summit and then having to think about the next. Uh, so it goes out um, uh, a good sort of five months in advance of the summit happening. Um, there is in a process of voting. And so uh, voting takes place online. It's changed a little over the, over the last couple of years. And we'll talk about a bit about that. Um, but community members will go and vote for talks that they see presented online and say, yes, I would attend that. Um, and and that's you know all goes into the the process. Um, step three: track chairs are appointed. So for each of the tracks, there's enterprise and storage and networking, and I can't remember them all, but there's whatever eight and nine tracks, something like that. Um, there are four track chairs who are appointed, and who get to determine essentially which of the talks that have been submitted into that track make it onto the schedule. And then. Um, Finally, the selected talks are put up on the schedule. There's some scheduling magic that happens by smart people with spreadsheets or whatever they do. And they get put on the schedule. And then you as community members, or us as community members, as I say, can go and view the schedule and say, I'm going to attend this talk. Right? Um, uh, and you know, you'll see, as you've seen many times this week, there may be 180 seats, but 300 people say they're going to attend the talk, but only 60 turn up. So it's all those kind of various dynamics of, of conference magic that happens. So we look at step one. Um, this is a very open process, which I think is great. In terms of the call for, for papers, who submitted uh, a talk in here? OK. Keep your hand up if you had it accepted. OK, so less, 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 less. So there's, um, there's no limit to the number of submissions from an individual. Not that I'm aware of. I haven't hit it. And I've submitted 12, I think, this last cycle. So. If there should be a limit, it would be, be less than 12. So, um, so there's no limit at number. I, I, actually, I landed three, which has turned, turned out to be a bit of a curse. But um, yeah. <laughs> there we go. I, already I know, if only I'd thought of that one. So um, there's no limit uh, num uh, to the number of submissions from an organization. And um, even though I, I don't have that data, I would love to see that. Rumor has it that HP, who's from HP? Anyone here? No? before I say anything rude about them. Rumor has it that HP has sent 700 people to this show. <laughs> Is it? OK. Still a big number. Yeah, so how many talks did they submit? Right, That's got to be very many. Um, and there are no rules regarding submitting talks into multiple categories. And I know that people do this, right? So they'll tweak the title, they'll tweak the abstract, and submit it into multiple categories. Right? And so there are no sort of limits about that. But I think that that's a good thing, right? Because you want diversity, and you want to be able to get um, lots of different perspectives, lots of different uh, angles on it. There's then voting, right? And so this is a very poor <laughs> <laughs> analogy. But voting you know, is often seen as being 
the sort of the one of the cornerstones of democracy, right? If it's if it's things if is that the result of a vote is all fair and equal, and and of course it's not. As, as Zimbabwe is one example, but there's very many different examples around the world where they have uh, voting systems that are just completely abused, and so they are not an indication of talking popularity of, of talk popularity on their own, right? Um, so vendors in this room, you can confirm or deny, right? But most vendors, and I've had this on authority, right, from from a couple of our competitors and partners and others, that this process goes on inside organizations, right? Which is, you know, high internal in, internal mailing list. The voting's begun. Here's a list of our sessions. Here's links to our sessions on the schedule. Go and vote them up now, right? Is any vendor? You don't have to say where you're from, and you can. But you know, is this? Does this resonate? Some nodding going on there, right? And so this is essentially direct ballot stuffing, right? And the bigger the company you are, the more effective you're going to be able to do this. We don't really do this at Canonical. We have tried it, but we're not big enough to really make a dent anyway. <laughs> so, um, but I know from talking to other track chairs, you can see very big companies. I won't pick on any, but big companies that employ hundreds of thousands of people that you know will have two or three hundred votes from their organization to go and and get a talk voted up. Um, then there's indirect vote stuffing, and and you know some people will call this marketing, but uh, people blog posting, vote for our talks. We've got really interesting things to talk about. We think the key issues are networking or storage or scalability or whatever, and we've got these talks about it, so go vote them up. We do that at Canonical, actually. And in fact, if I go and click on that, you'll probably even see, boom, boom, boom. There we go. So, um, so yeah, we do that. And um, social media campaigns as well, so we'll, um, we'll tweet about it. Right, we've got these talks. Please go and vote for them. Uh, and other, but other people do that. I see that all the time. Morantis are great at that. Go vote for our stuff, you know, in their newsletters and all those things. So um, I'm not sure I should aspire to that, but they're very good at it. And there's a lot of mutual back scratching that goes on. So community members of, uh, you know, I'll vote for you if you vote for me, and and why don't we submit a talk together, and then we can both vote each other up and feel good about it. And so, um, but luckily, so there's a lot of abuse of that voting process goes on. Uh, but luckily, it's only one of the the inputs. Um, there's track, the track chair selection then, um, and this is you know the process of ha selecting the selectors, selecting the people that are going to select the talks. Um, typically chosen by the foundation. That's how I believe it works. I don't know if it's strictly true. Um, uh, the, the criteria for selection seem to be based around people that know stuff, right? So I'm an expert in storage or networking or Nova or whatever it may be. Um, people that have shown that they are good members of the community and have been a good track chair before. Uh, people who are active members of the community in some way haven't been a track chair before, may not necessarily be a technical expert, but have contributed to the community in other ways, whether it's documentation or joining working groups or whatever it may be, running meetups or something like that. Um, I wanted to call out this, being a, an active member of the track selection process. So this is my first time being a track chair in, in, involved in this summit. And it's actually quite a lot of work. To do it well, I think, is quite a lot of work. And that you have to coordinate with the other three track chairs. And you have to take have a, at least, what do we have? I think it was four kind of hour-long meeting discussions where we're stepping through the process and doing work offline where we're um, reviewing all the different talks and, and sort of putting our case forward. So it's a time-consuming role. It requires quite a bit of work. Um, and it's not a, a thing that you can take on lightly. So I can understand how the foundation will choose to pick James, for example. Not that you've ever been a track chair, as far as I'm aware. But if James had been a really good track chair previously, that he would get to do it again, right? I can understand that process. But I still think there's, there's definite room for it. Uh, uh, improvement there. How the teams work together is that, again, in my experience, it may be different in some of the other um, uh, streams, but um, there's typically four persons per track, uh, voting the relevancy of the topic, um, how interestingly the synopsis was written or the title. I'm very interested to see different types of talks being submitted. So those um, uh, controversial ones or attention-grabbing ones, you could say that this was one of those. 
but um, but you know you, you do see those the uh, OpenStack is doomed and, and those kind of uh, talks um, but also some very technical ones that you had to go and sort of Google to find out what it was they were actually talking about um, so all of these things the relevancy of the topic technical detail um, how interesting the speaker was or how you thought they were going to be just very difficult to gauge um, were all taken into account. What was very interesting is we quickly worked out that you could categorize these talks. Okay, these are uh, kind of um, inflammatory, attention-grabbing talks. These ones are sort of technical, meaty content. These are uh, trying to deal with people type of issues, right? So to categorize them into themes. And that was very good to work in that basis. Um, the way that we certainly worked is that we all went our separate ways, wrote up our list of the ones that we thought were good, made some notes as to why we thought they were good, then circled back where you know the four of us, or actually it was the three of us, because one of us didn't really do very much. Um, <laughs> the three of us where we all said, yep, we like that talk, that made it onto the initial list. Very interesting, I think I'll go over this point somewhere else, but I'll say it here, was that, um, very interesting, is that there wasn't as much commonality as you would expect. Right. We had something like 120 odd talks in our track, which was the enterprise um, stream and enterprise track. And of those, the initial list where we all said, yep, we want that, was nine. Right. So it was under 10%, which was I, surprised me. Right, I would have thought that given that we're all kind of similar backgrounds and thinking about the same stuff as on an enterprise track, the fact that it was under 10% I thought was, was interesting. Um, so the initial, late, initial list drawn up, we have a debate as to which ones are going to make it on, which not. People state their cases, et cetera. Um, they get put on the list. Some of them get moved out and put into other tracks, right? Because it's either they were just put in plainly the wrong track, or we think it's a, a more relevant subject to go other. So some of the observations from this was I saw that as the number of submissions has grown, um, there seems to be less weight placed upon voting. I don't know because I wasn't a track chair previously, but um, talking to some of the other track chairs is that certainly in the early days there was much more weight placed upon the voting. Um, now there is not. It's only one of the inputs. And, and indeed, we selected talks on our track. We selected talks that had very few votes, but we thought that they were interesting and relevant topics. Right? And it's just maybe they hadn't stuffed the ballot directly or indirectly or, or marketed their talk at all. Um, so the flip side of that is that reliance on the track chairs has increased, right? So track chairs have to do quite a lot of work, and they have to do that selection process. Um, but the track chairs see the, see the talks very differently. There's a lot of very interesting discussion, some of it um, uh, quite exciting, um, about which talks we think should get through. Um, there was very little guidance. Track chairs are, are, have an awful lot of scope, right, to determine what they think the issues are in that track. And there was no, uh, certainly not that I'm aware, uh, any sort of guidance given from tech committee or uh, the working group, relevant working groups, in our case, the Win the Enterprise group, um, or the foundation for that matter, on we think these are the key themes that you should look at. And I think that's both a good and a bad thing. So uh, uh, there wasn't a great deal of cross-track collaboration. And that may be because we were a non-technical track. Maybe technical tracks um, have greater uh, cross-track collaboration in terms of uh, ensuring that themes or, 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 or talks are dealt with in that way. Um, and there wasn't any kind of session feedback to take into account. So um, whilst content, content is king and should be king, I think also trying to understand um, uh, whether that topic is relevant and whether that presenter very hard to say this diplomatically, but whether the presenter is going to be engaging for people or not, right? And uh, uh, there was no sort of feedback to be able to look at in that respect. So move on to some of the improvements, I think. So, um, and this is discussion, right? So I want to be able to see, do you think um, we should start to limit influence that big organizations can have in terms of trying to submit talks into this process, or individuals, right? So take my example, Canonical submitted about 40 talks, 36, something like that, of which I submitted about a third of them, right? So that's because I was tasked with making sure we get talks, right? But should, should there be a hard limit on either the organization or the number? Should there be a hard limit on anything in that respect? What do people think? Yeah? 
No? No, they can be. So as a, as a sponsor, you can buy a track. Or if you, um, so you know, we've done that, HP have done that. I know a number of other vendors have done that. Um, but that's clearly indicated as a sponsor track. Right? It has this brown color on the agenda, which means <laughs> so <laughs> don't, don't go. Um, and the, the oh, yeah, we did it right yesterday. So um, the, uh, and as a sponsor, um, you know, I know you'll keep me honest here, but as a, as a different levels of sponsor, get one or two talks or something like that as part of your sponsorship. But again, they're, they're indicated as being sponsored talks. Um, so there's no process by which, oh, you're a sponsor, and therefore we're going to be more favorable to the fact that you've submitted talks through the call for papers process. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So that's very enlightening to me. I only took one talk because I was like, oh, well, you know, I've got one talk. I want to take it back to the community. Right. How do you get So, well, and here's the thing. So in our case, I'm submitting lots of talks in, but I'm, I'm, I'm putting other people to be the speakers, right? So I'm the submitter, but not necessarily the speaker. But in, in multiple cases, we had, you know, James was down to do about three talks, I think. But um, uh, so there we go. Yes. But that's a very valid point, and I wasn't aware of that gentleman's agreement. So. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it was kind of like you're putting in a talk because you're experts in that talk, and you mm -hmm. can share that with the community. And I mean, I don't think I could ever say I'm an expert more than what I'm saying. And I, I think that at some point, that kind of slows down. OK. So I gentlemen, you've had your hand up for a long time. Can we use the microphone, please? Sorry, should I should have said that? No, it's wired, so I, I don't want to rip it out of. So I'll give you a practical example for another uh, conference for which I am. I was on the uh, selection committee. Now that I say this, probably I won't be next year. Um, two years ago, we tried to limit the number of talks by company. Mm -hmm. And we found two things happened. Uh, as the gentleman there said, there's game playing which happens. Uh, we've, we've seen some cases where we tried to limit the number of talks by an individual, and we just picked 17 people in a group. John, Jim, whatever. There's a whole bunch of names. Yeah. We picked talks by four different people, and it turns out that three of them were mysteriously unavailable, and all four talks landed on the same person. Right. So when you try to game play this, when you try to put limits, you will have find people will game play the system because the motivations you're talking about, and I'm a vendor, so I'm driven by the same things, but I'm also an ATC on a project and I'd like to talk about my project. Right. I think honestly, what we have here, which is an open process, is a better process. Agree. And, and, and so my, when I wrote this, I, I the, the limit anything, comment is because I don't think we can limit anything. I don't think we should limit anything. Because exactly, we, the moment we create a system, then we're just going to create the system that games it anyway. Yeah. And, and so we're much better to work downstream in the selection process than we are upstream at this level. So I, I, I think you've highlighted an, an important problem, uh, or an interesting problem at least. I, I, I would like to see what the numbers are. A third of the talks being accepted is really a very, very good metric. Mm -hmm. If you say that there's uh, 196 stocks being accepted, or 200 talk, what was the number the same? 296? Um, it was close yeah. to 300, right? If you have 296 out of 1,100, honestly, that's not a problem. You know, you can't, this is not a situation where everybody can be given a spot. Mm -hmm. But there are places where they have gone down that route where they've said, encourage more participation, and for all the people who have not gotten a 40-minute slot, tell them we'll give you a 15-minute slot. Right. Let me get to the numbers. Where was yeah. that? Yeah. So 295. Honestly, yeah, 295 yeah. out of 1,094. Honestly, this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that trying to do things which seem simplistic, like limits, are probably the wrong solution. 
But if there's places to do improvements, yeah, absolutely. I think there are uh, more diversity in talks, like more different subjects. Um, that would be interesting. Okay. But limiting, no. Thank you. I think the other problem you'd run into trying to limit by uh, company or by entity would be that then you are you're letting the corporate politics of each entity determine the talk slate here. So for instance, I work at Cisco. Yep. I've got, I don't know, 140,000 coworkers or something. Um, and amongst those 140,000, I'm, I'm basically a nobody. And I'm not saying that I should give a talk, I should give a talk. Um, but I would never get to propose one, right? If there was a corporate limit, right. they would throw the marquee speakers at it. And I think that the that Summit could potentially miss out yeah, on absolutely. less recognizable but dynamic speakers. Some of the brightest gems are, are deep in the mind, right? So I know at my own company, HP, and several other companies, people put a lot of talking just to come to the Summit. Like HP yep. will send somebody who gets a talk accepted. So there's a lot of relatively repetitive safe mm -hmm. topic talks going in just to get people here. And I've noticed, I mean, this summit, there's so many Ceph talks, it's, it hurts. Um, I get the thing, it's like, I want, I want to find a good Ceph update, but I don't know which one is going to be any good because everybody's talking about Ceph. And yeah. I've spoken to a lot of the people who present, and they're like, well, we had to present on something, and there's always people interested in Ceph. Yeah. So it's yeah. almost like the, 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 the corporate motivation that, and that's a good, I think that's a great topic. That's raised that, I think it was probably Claire or Lauren raised that actually, is that exactly a lot of people um, submit talks so that they are guaranteed a, a, a means of coming to the, to the mm. thing. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> 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 um, so it sounds like, like, you know, people don't necessarily want to put a hard limit on the submission process. And you mentioned kind of downstream in the selection process. Yeah. There may be more opportunities. Do you think that for track chairs, getting data about this would be useful input? Yes. So I think, I mean, there's two areas. And I if just we don't limit it, but just at least track it, like that this person submitted 50 talks, or this is from, you know, this is one of that, that I think would be useful, absolutely. So I, I mean, I talk generally. Uh, I think there's transparency. Full period is going to help. You know, sunlight as being the greatest disaffected and all those good things. So, and I remember there being an incident. You, you'll probably correct me on this. There an incident where somebody got voted onto. I can't remember if it's tech committee or the board. And then somebody did the analysis on where their votes came from, and it was 95% from that individual's company, right? And um, or 85%. And so I think that would be, you know. If voting data is available, especially for track chairs to be able to make decisions, I think that would be extremely helpful. Um, I think it's also, voting is extremely hard, I know, as a community member. Who voted on, on talks? Yeah. When there's, when there's over 1,000, you don't have time to view all the talks to be able to make comparative decisions, right? And so you keep skipping through to find talks that you're interested in, oh, maybe I'll vote for that one. But after a while, you get bored of finger ache or whatever, and that's it. So. Um, I think theme-based voting, voting would be very interesting, right? To be able to say, these are the themes, you know, Ceph. I want more Ceph and want less Ceph, right? right? To be able to have whatever, neutron scalability or whatever it is, themes so that to help track chairs be able to s select talks based upon people's interest in those themes. Sorry, so you had another point. Uh, I don't want to monopolize the mic, so I'll, why don't you go ahead and I'll, oh, okay. after you. So, so my point was, I, I love the idea of theme-based. Um, talks so that uh, chairs are given, you know, these are the themes that we want to uh, talk, have talks around, so that's great. The second is we do need to also allocate or look for uh, new entrants into OpenStack, whether it's women or underrepresented minorities or, you know, absolutely new members or new people getting engaged in OpenStack. So we do need to encourage those types of players also to mm -hmm. be able to speak. Maybe first time speaker, that would be a you know, long time. So I think time that's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask. You started saying it would be good if the track chairs had information about where the votes came from, mm -hmm. from what the young lady said. It would be good for track chairs to know demographic information about the submitter. Uh, I personally think that's a horrible idea. I think if you want to have a selection process which is a meritocracy, you should have as little information about who the presenter is and try and gauge the talk as a pure meritocracy. Right. And I know that this is a very, very hard thing to do because 
Some people will go to the extent of getting a professional writer to write the abstract when the person is a shitty speaker. <laughs> okay, come on. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a motivation here as a vendor to get a talk accepted. People, we've seen people go to extremes. That's an extreme. It's very hard. I know as a track chair, again, we were trying to make a conscious effort not to look at the company that the speaker, that the proposal was coming from, right? Because I cannot help but be influenced by that. Yeah, so I'll just end by saying I think if you do get that information, as a person submitting a talk, now you have, you have given me the strong motivation, mm -hmm. good or bad, to include a woman on my presenter list. Get a person who is a first-time contributor on my uh, speaker list. I would rather have it be known in the public that your selection process is entirely based on right. only the stuff which is in the abstract, and everything else is ripped off before you get to see it. You don't know the name of the presenter. So it has to be blind. blind it has to be. Process. It has to be a quote. Try to be a blind process. Mm -hmm. Though I know that a really blind process is a hard thing to do. It puts more of a you know, a weight on you as the so that, And that's very interesting. I hadn't thought about it being blind in that respect. So instead of name company, just having some whatever unique ID. That's correct. And yeah. even okay. if you were to do the voting that way, where we as the public have to vote for talks, strip the name of the speaker out. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a name. Yesterday I went to a talk just because I noticed the names of two people on the panel. And I said, if those two people, it's going to be an interesting talk. Right. But I want to take that away and just leave it for a talk to say, the talk is about replication and trope. I don't know who's giving the talk, but I want to know about the subject. OK, thanks. Thank you. So I was going to say, actually, I think encouraging new contributors and actively discriminating, if you want, on new contributors, women in open stack, et cetera, is a great idea. It's something we need to do to rebalance the, the situation we're in. So maybe have every track will say, we, w we will pick one based on, on the, who the contributor is and you know, we will pick a, a minority or an underrepresented or whatever for one talk so you know that's actually happening and then do the bulk of them blind because otherwise you get a lot of if, if, if you go purely on abstracts you're going to get a lot of groupthink and a lot of um, yeah. the, the same things and people who can write good abstracts are people who've done it before so you're, you're fundamentally there discriminating against new people perhaps who might have something interesting to say but can't polish the abstracts far enough so ha okay. act actively split your, your selection and say we'll do one or two talks that are actively trying to encourage a certain thing and do the bulk of them on a, on a blind vote instead so you get the best of both worlds. OK, thank you. Good, good feedback. So I think, um, uh, I mean, some of the suggestions that I thought through were, you know, obviously the role of the track chair is crucial. Uh, I think they still need to be appointed by a board or committee or some organizers. I don't think we want to have any process of voting for track chairs or anything like that, because we'll just extend this process forever of you know how do we select the people that select the selectors. So um, I think there should be some level of rotation. So I don't know whether, uh, I mean, granted, we want experienced track chairs who are active in the process, but I don't know. I don't know if anybody is always a track chair, right? Maybe there's a role for that. But um, uh, I think there should be a, a, a degree of rotation in them. And I think that you should, and this probably happens already, but there should be some structure around the backgrounds from which track chairs are selected so that, you know, um, there's limits to the influence that vendors have, that we're getting users, you know, maybe a scale user, maybe a new user, um, because they have different requirements and different interests, those kind of things. Um, uh, track chairs, it would say, not unusual for them to dis disagree in doing a little bit of research and saw that this is a common problem in, in talk selection. And there's a NIPS experiment that showed how they, they to, to select one set of talks, used two different selection committees, and then used some fuzzy scoring and noisy scoring and stuff to be able to, uh, to get to this process. And it was quite interesting. Um, what they saw is the two different committees you know, had a 57% rejection rate of papers. And so very hard to get people to agree on that. So this is a common problem. Um, but they're influencing, they're, sorry, they're implementing that system of noisy scoring to try and uh, uh, fix it moving forward. But we can't really do that because of the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, so I do think that we need to get feedback um, from talks so that we know as a track chair in the future, if you'll be able to say um, this talk, this topic 
got high, scored very highly. And we can see, especially over time, these themes are being scored very highly. I think that would be great input you know, for future tracks. That's probably a bigger problem in terms of how we get feedback and whether that's app delivered or paper delivered or the incentives that people get, et cetera, et cetera. But I think getting feedback on previous talks, having previous success or failure as, a, as an input into that process, I think would be vital. Um, and I also think um, feedback from the, the board, the tech committee, and the number of working groups now. The, the session here, just previous, was from the product group, I think. They are looking at the roadmap and the themes that are coming uh, in the future with OpenStack. I think getting input from them as to these are the things that we want to deal with would be extremely valuable as the track chat. What time is it? Are we supposed to finish? Now? Yeah. I, th I thought so. Thank you. So, um, th so that was it. So suggestions, you know, it was, um, as to how anybody other suggestions, how we think we can improve it or comments. Nope. Well, this is my first time, so I can't say yes or no yet. But, um, but I don't believe so. I'd be very surprised if that happened. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, if, in, in the absence of any sort of scoring system and feedback system, that is one that could be used, right? Yeah, I think anonymous scoring through scheduling would be the best one. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a double thumbs up from the back there, anonymous scoring. Would be good. Yes, sir. So I'm just going to pick on myself. Uh, don't put regex in your abstract and think people think it's slow. Think, think that people think you're clever because people don't understand it. OK. <laughs> Does that mean time's up? <laughs> All righty, thank you.